Yesterday, we had a session um, on exploring polycentric governance and Web3 ecosystems. So if you missed that, we're going to be sharing the recording around. It was a really interesting uh, session uh, talking about looking at the decision space and how to decide and the voting space and different types of voting, including conviction voting and some new Web3 tools. Um, so uh, that recording will be on the common stack all around. And today we're going to look at cultural frameworks for DAOs and Olivia is going to talk about the three influential models. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Ostrom's principles and share some of the learnings from uh, implementing the principles in the token engineering commons. And then we're going to just talk and free flow a little bit um, about stigma merger coordination and some of our shared experiences in uh, working in and flowing with decentralized organizations and uh, some best practices or experiences that we can share. So thanks so much for being here with us. Yes. Hello, everyone. So as most of you know, we've been working on implementing Ostrom's eight principles into the cultural build of the token engineering commons. And we had a book club to read governing the commons and a lot of very interesting insights have been coming from studying her book. So Something I, I don't see so much about uh, when talking about Ostrom's, Ostrom is talking about the three influential models that she kind of starts the book uh, presenting them and in, the, in, a, in a flow that, um, that brings why, uh, why the eight principles are so important and why the research uh, to bring more alternatives to self-governing uh, institutions is so important in the face of the three influential models. So what are they? Uh, they're basically um, models that have been um, written in academia, but uh, from they have references from uh, even from Aristotle's uh, very old references of um, how these influential models affect our society and uh, the politics that we have now and most of the corporations have been basing themselves on how these models uh, were placed. So in, uh, if we could resume the three of them, uh, they do talk about how we, we, they have the assumption that we as humans don't have the capability of organizing ourselves in a way that it's beneficial for us and for the collective. So therefore we need a central entity that will govern us and organize us because we don't know how to do that and we are depleting our shared resources doing so. So, so then she brings, um, she brings them one next to the other and uh, starts to explore how we could actually organize ourselves. And that's what the eight principles are about. So I'll just talk a little bit about each one of the influential models and how they have been deeply uh, ingrained in our behavior and the way we think about things and, and how the first step is start challenging the assumptions we have about these models and how influential they are in, in our lives and in society. So the tragedy of the commons, uh, it's very controversial. The, the DAO space has been talking about it a lot and it comes from uh, a very um, white supremacist um, writer that has been questioned uh, his posture has been questioned for uh, for a while now, but it's still interesting to see the model for what it is and the way that um, it's presented to us because it still influences a lot of our politics and uh, of how corporations function. So the tragedy of the commons basically says that what is common to the greatest number has the least care bestowed upon it. This was uh, Aristotle who said that, uh, and Hardin has been uh, expanding on that view. So he mostly talks about how um, in, in shared resources, 
we have a direct benefit from extracting it, but we have delayed costs. So there is this idea of we will only see uh, the problem in the future. And if I take something really quick, I'm the smart one and I'll have it. But if I wait to take only in the moment I need it, then maybe I won't have it anymore because somebody else took it. So this talks also about discount rates and the incentive we have for caring about something in the long term or caring about something in the short term. And it is really hard to create incentives to, for a large number of people to care about something in the long term when there is this feeling of constantly being a fool. So, oh, if I care about it for a long time, because I care about that resource like water, for example. Um, but if I don't know that everyone else is also caring about that, then maybe I'll just look like a fool because I won't have in the future and I won't take it now. So that's uh, a big part of the challenge that we, we've been facing on how to redesign the way that we uh, talk about those incentive mechanisms for long-term use of appropriation of resources. So that is kind of the base of, of the tragedy of the commons, that um, if it's there, if it's free for all, nobody will care about it. And this has a big assumption implicit in it that is only exclusive things have value. And this is very dangerous because is the, the, it's the center of um, it's the center of the the core of the central power as we have been seeing it on how politicians and um, wealthy uh, owners of um, big corporations have have power because they have access to a resource that many need, but they can um, open or close that door uh, in their own discretion. So they achieved, um, yeah, they achieved this, exclu this exclusivity power. They can exclude others from appropriating a resource because uh, they were trusted to do the best use of this resource and to let people appropriate based on their knowledge of um, providing th th that resource system uh, sustainable use over time. But we know that that's not exactly how things work and uh, that's why we've been studying so much and trying to find other other ways and mechanisms to appropriate resources that not giving all its exclusivity power to uh, a few. So then we come to the prisoner's dilemma that is is a it's an extract of the tragedy of the commons. They are basically the same thing, but the prisoner's dilemma was transformed into a game. Uh, that is, um, it's, a, it's a non cooperative game. So he says that if, if two people don't have the ability to communicate or, or they don't want, or that is not uh, in the rules of the game that they can communicate towards collaboration, that they will both choose the most optimal, uh, the most optimal choice for themselves individually without thinking about the choices of the other or, or about the other in general. So um, Ostrom gives the example of uh, if we have a field and we have, uh, I have some cows and my neighbor has some cows and we both share this field. 
if I don't collaborate with him and if I don't talk to him, um, I want to put the more cows here as possible because I want to use the space I have. But then he also thinks the same. Oh, I want to put the, the more cows here possible because I get more uh, in return if I do that. But if they both put a lot of cows in there, um, some of the cows will die because they won't have uh, the optimal space for them to leave and they won't be healthy. And in the end of the day, they will have uh, less, um, less return than if they had a smaller number of cows. But they continue to do that even knowing so. Because if one stops to put so many cows, then it just means that the other is making more profit. And if I stop to put cows, then the other one will just put them anyways and they will come to my field. So this is a, yeah, this is a game that they both lose if they choose their de facto strategy, but they have no incentives to, or they have no chance to choose a cooperative strategy. So they end up cooperating by choosing the defect. So if I put a lot of cows, if he puts a lot of cows, maybe some of our cows will die, but okay, we have, we have something, we have some profit there. So this balance, um, she calls a non-Pareto Pareto outcome, non-Pareto optimal outcome. That is, they have something, but it's not the best they could have. And, and this is something that um, so many people have written about, and it's this paradox that individual rational strategies lead to collective irrational outcomes. And people feel very puzzled about that because it's like, well, but the, if they looked at it like from a collective perspective, they would see that they needed to have different strategies but they continue to look from the individual perspective and that seems optimal. So this makes me question even the use of rationality. And that's something Ostrom brings along the book. Uh, the fact that we always look at very constrained variables and, and this might be the problem because humans are so complex and have so many other variables that not the ones that we're necessarily looking at. So maybe some of the variables that are not included in this game is the relationship they have, the, the health state that they're in, uh, what, how do their families interact with each other? What is their... Uh, why do they need that profit for? Like there are so many parts of why people choose what they choose that it's usually not included in a rational strategy or not included in academic books that really need to be uh, perceived uh, from an empirical observation. So, so this paradox seems to exist of like, oh, wow, why, why are they, why the irrational outcomes? Well, maybe they're not irrational. Maybe there is just variables there that we are failing on incorporating. And then the last one is the, the logic of collective action uh, that is most known as the free rider problem. That is something they all share in common, but, um, yeah, is, is, this, is, this, is this scenario that if a lot of people were doing something, maybe I don't need to do it because I'm involved in the benefits either way. It's like the, that work in school when, and, and, and I, it, it's interesting that even kids go through that. It's like, oh, there's five people in the group and three people were doing something. And then there's those two that are like, Oh, maybe I don't need to do anything because my name is there already. I'll get the, the, the grades anyways. Um, yeah, so this is the, the free rider problem. And she talks about um, scaling in this case too. 
that we still don't have much of uh, a material to analyze large institutions or large organizations that don't fall into the pre writer problem. But, but this also makes me question, um, I think the value flows that token engineering introduces of, of um, bringing value from the invisible to the visible, being able to tokenize different streams of value, uh, it's a possible solution to this problem because people might not be contributing to something that is expected, but people might be contributing in other ways. So who are the free writers? Um, how, how are they free writing? What are their motivations? Uh, what are things that, that maybe we are failing on seeing the value that people want to, want to give, want to produce? And this again, feeds this narrative from the state and from the corporations that people are lazy, that people don't have uh, their intrinsic motivations, that if people had universal basic income, they would just not do anything. And I think we have been all questioning this, this narrative very much and moving more towards a place to um, to listen to people and to have more human design systems and understand how um, how to bring more of this value that 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 was invisible before and maybe that was what we've been calling the free rider problem. So this was just a yeah an overview on this this three models and I just want to open for questions and comments and see if anyone has something to to add here. I think one of the most interesting um, aspects, uh, all of these are, are really great frameworks for understanding sort of the the um, incentive breakdowns in uh, large scale collaboration. Can you scroll back one slide to the um, prisoner's dilemma? I, I came across an interesting um, uh, kind of addition to the prisoner's dilemma. So um, I don't remember the exact details, but I mean, you have this uh, reward matrix where it's defect or cooperate um, and the dominant strategy is for both to defect, even though both would be better off if they both cooperated. Um, there's an interesting higher layer mechanism that we can uh, uh, include here. So pretend before the prisoner's dilemma, does everybody know that the prisoner, is there, is there anybody that doesn't know the prisoner's dilemma? Maybe we should say that. Are there a hands up if we need to go through the uh, experiment in more detail or are we all a little bit familiar? Okay, cool. Um, so if we kind of reverse to the, the beginning of the scenario and pretend these two prisoners before they go on that bank heist and get caught by the police and then have the option to defect or cooperate, if we introduce a godfather figure um, and the godfather says to both prisoners, if either of you squeal to the cops, you're dead. Um, now we have an external uh, incentive for both of these prisoners to cooperate. So now we go through the scenario, they get caught, they're offered, uh, they're taken into their separate interrogation rooms and they're offered to the chance to squeal on each other. And without that godfather incentive, we see the dominant strategy be defect and both end up in kind of the, um, the worst um, Nash equilibrium. But if we add this external staking mechanism, they've, they are now staked, they've staked their lives um, to, to not squealing essentially. And if they squeal, then that stake is slashed, they lose their life. And all of a sudden the dominant strategy becomes cooperate, cooperate. So by adding an external uh, incentive, and I mean, this one is fairly coercive, of course, um, but we actually move the dominant strategy from defect, defect to cooperate, cooperate. And I'm interested how we can use staking in other ways, of course, non-coercive ways, where it's not someone coming from outside saying, if you don't do this, you will die. It's us saying, I, we all want, we choose to cooperate. So we put money on the line, we put tokens on the line, we put reputation on the line. And this is now our staked collateral that we lose if we go the defect route. 
So I think it's interesting how we, we can look at the prisoner's dilemma as one uh, kind of game, but then we, we have these meta games on top where we can add uh, staking mechanisms. And in the Godfather, obviously, you know, the, the stake is your life. You're not going to give that up for, um, you know, even one year less in jail. But if we can add, um, you know, other staking mechanisms where we are basically committing to the commons uh, beforehand saying, I'm staking my tokens or I'm staking my reputation, I'm staking my money on doing the right thing in this community. And if I don't, then that gets slashed. So I'm, I'm really interested how we can kind of layer on additional incentives and not necessarily coercive incentives because incentives are dangerous as well. If they're used by someone else to control what we are doing, we have to be careful. Uh, even if, you know, as parents to kids, um, we have to be careful about incentives we set. But if we set uh, incentives for ourselves, for the behavior that we want to follow as a commons, I think there's some interesting area to play there. I'm interested to hear Julio, since uh, he just shared that he did his master's thesis. I would love to hear also your reflections and maybe a response to what Jeff was saying. Yeah, <laughs> I was talking in the chat. So it was a, a long time ago, and I don't recall all the details, but uh, the, we did simulations using the iterated prisoner's dilemma. So uh, with the dilemma being repeated over and over and the partners accumulating or losing points based on their choices. And just by sharing the last vote and seeing the total amount of points, they, they would start to kind of tend towards the strategy of uh, being altruists, being uh, co cooperating, right? So because they see that their points is rising and uh, and they see that the other person is not always defecting, so they tend to behave in this in this direction. So even without the Godfather figure, if you only have this uh, shared, uh, they don't even need to communicate. They just need to see each other's actions, so they already start to kind of behave in a more altruistic way. It was very nice. I'm, I'm going to try to find the, the the paper and share with the group later if you want. Yeah, that's so interesting that, uh, I mean, that is communication already, right? If people, if, if people can see each other, it's a visual communication of some sort, at least you have uh, the full picture that you can, it's information that you can use to make better decisions. And I think that the godfather is the state. Like the, the, the state is one of the godfathers. It is someone uh, adding a coercive, uh, a coercive mechanism for people to do, to, to get into a cooperative cooperative, but then at what cost, right? And that's what you're saying. Like, how can we bring something that it's not so costly to people and that, and that all can benefit? That's probably a great segue because of what you're saying about seeing other cheap, uh, people's behavior and monitoring. So um, maybe it's a good segue to, to start digging into the eight principles because I feel like, uh, yeah, there's so much there. Oh, I, I actually removed this because I didn't want to offend anybody. I made this meme yesterday. Um, I hope I'm not offending anyone. I actually removed it and then it came back. Um, so yes, Mother Ostrom came. Uh, and yes, the feminine divine has many expressions. Uh, so she came and kind of, I guess, started to show us how we can liberate ourselves from this prison uh, and introduce the principles for governing the commons. And there's, a, if you haven't read it, there's, um, it's free online. So we'll be sharing those links. And Jeff actually uh, wrote this article, Automating uh, Ostrom for DAO management. And this has been kind of a big seed for starting a lot of this work and um, looking at how we can implement these principles within DAO frameworks. Uh, so there are eight, uh, if you haven't memorized them yet. Uh, and I, I'm realizing more, I guess, as we study how many kind of meta layers there are um, so in looking at the first principle, 
and having clearly defined boundaries. So what does that mean? So we see in the, um, with the cows that, you know, if there's no boundaries around things, um, that there tends to be just this different mental model or paradigm shift or, or behavioral shift in how people treat things. So putting boundaries, um, and that means many different things, helps, especially in the way that, you know, in decentralized organizations, so there's a few layers of boundaries, at least in my kind of interpretation or my study in, in how we're looking at things. Um, so there's in the individual level and in dealing with a decentralized or kind of more open space organization, we don't have as clear of roles or hierarchies or definitions of, of how things are going because it's much more emergent and organic. Um, but we have to set boundaries and that goes for individuals, you know, uh, as in, a sovereign individual, I have to set boundaries with other humans and how we interact. Um, there are boundaries around economies, like if you are familiar with um, augmented bonding curves, and I don't want to go down the technical wormhole, but uh, basically, um, there is a mechanism that we are employing where people who are profiting off of the system. So if people are selling uh, the token, that there's a small, we call exit tribute or tax that feeds back into a community funding pool. Um, so it creates this regenerative or kind of more sustainable loop, or at least um, creates this boundary around the system to where even if people are coming and speculating off of an economy, or even if they're coming just to profit and they don't care about the commons, they don't care about the community, um, they just are making money off the speculation and don't want to judge them, but uh, that that there is a, a mechanism there and a boundary having that little bit of tax to protect the community. And then um, there's also, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of the other discussion we were having yesterday, Livia, but um, but yeah, boundaries have have kind of several meanings is what we're realizing. And also, you know, the edges between communities or um, if you look in nature how you know when you're walking and then all of a sudden the plants shift and everything shifts and you're in a new kind of climate zone or you're in a new area if you look at the edges is where a lot of the interesting interactions take place and uh, so yeah I, I'm really interested to hear kind of other people's interpretations of this or I don't know Livy if we want to go through all of them and give a little reflection or open as we go through through each one yeah, maybe we can give like a quick overview of each one and then open for for conversation. And I think also in the in the boundaries one is um, it's really interesting to set boundaries in a cyber cyberspace. And a lot of the examples that we have to follow are from physical spaces that had very clear boundaries coming not only from land but also from the resources from the resource systems they had so this has been interesting to understand what are all of the resource systems that we have and how um, ephemeral they are or how subjective they are or how grounded they are so for example, governance power is a resource system that needs clearly defined boundaries. So who, who has access to governance power? How is that access given? Uh, what does that access uh, does inside of other resource systems? And, um, and then we have also like funds that are a very clear resource system that needs defined boundaries, like who can, who has access to funds, how are funds released, uh, where are the funds coming from. And, and from there, we start to see like, oh, what are all of the resources of the space? And how do we start to understand where they start, where they end? And like Jess was saying, we are like uh, an ecosystem of so many overlapping communities that have all sorts of overlapping boundaries as well that we try to delineate the max possible but it's a challenge so that's also like yeah really interesting for us to hear everyone's inputs on that and then the principle two is congruence between appropriation and provision it's mostly uh what are the rules 
or what are some set of agreements we have to make sure the system will be sustainable and regenerative. So do we have, um, do we have a balance between what comes in so and and what and and what leaves the system so the provision is everything that is coming in everyone that is providing to the the institution and appropriation uh, everyone that is taking and making use of that and how we make sure that is uh, optimal and always regenerative and then collective choice arrangements are um, making sure that people have a say in the organization and that the rules are coming from the people that are involved within the boundaries that were established. So if everyone that is appropriating and providing to these resource systems uh, have a say, then then we can follow all the other principles that are coming. And Jess, you wanted to say something about uh, this one? Yeah, I guess um, we're realizing how Oops. important. Oops. How did this happen? <laughs> how did this happen? Um, um, yeah, sorry. number number three also, I think we're experiencing in with the token engineering commons, um, for example, we had a reward system to reward contributions. And it was based on a certain system and that system had not really been tested or we hadn't done any data analysis on it and then now we looked at the distribution and some people said hold up wait a minute this is really skewed we should we should do some data analysis now that we have this data um, so there is some discussion around whether or not people want to make a change or modify an agreement so this agreement happened six months ago. There was a vote with uh, 10 people. And now, you know, six months later, we have new information. We have more uh, community members. Um, and this decision will affect the allocation of tokens and kind of the, the I guess, the voice that people have in this economy. Uh, and now there's some discussion of changing this agreement. And it was the first time that the community had really been tested and how democratic we really are or what is our capacity to change and uh you know what we realized is power systems or many systems become quickly entrenched and because humans are so resistant to change uh it becomes difficult and a big point of tension and maybe conflict in communities when some people are calling for change and other people want to remain with the status quo or there's like this tension and friction there. Um, so the ability to modify the rules and to modify the process is something so incredibly important. And uh, the making sure that those rules are so clear and so visible to all so that they can act upon them or propose or request a change. Um, and this is happening as well. We, um, Jeff and I and the block science team are supporting Gitcoin and progressive decentralization and they're going to have a DAO now and we're looking at um, anti sybil and the machine learning algorithm that's helping to detect fraud and we're trying to now open that up so that stewards in the community can have a say in what edge cases or what um, grants are thumbs up or thumbs down for certain behaviors. Um, so in opening this up we're also trying to make sure as early on in the process that people can change the rules or request if there's a you know appeals process if anyone is sanctioned or anyone is kind of uh, kicked out of the community you know or uh, their grant isn't allowed in that they they are able to change and modify and request uh, an appeal so these are just a few examples um, of why number three is so important and i'm sure you maybe have some experience as well of, of communities you've been in where uh, it was very difficult to change a rule or an agreement after it was made. Yeah, and also how the, the people who are part of the system will be the ones who have more information to create the best choice of agreements. Um, and also have more information to modify them when it comes to time. And then um, principle four uh, talks about monitoring and should bring something very interesting about information 
information as um, a source of uh, power and also kind of an asset in the in the organization because if you have information you can make better decisions and if you are in a place of monitoring you're most likely going to be exposed to more information so that's one of the incentives that she brings on why having a mutual monitoring system so if all the people in the in the organization uh, have if they feel comfortable to watch each other or uh, to see if this agreements that they made collectively are being followed and if they are not feeling in that place of the fool um, she talks a lot about the sucker like nobody wants to be the sucker so if no one is complying to the rules i'm not going to comply to the rules but then being a monitor uh, makes you feel more comfortable in this space because you see that people are complying to the rules and that incentivizes you to comply as well. And there is a, a healthy uh, organism for this to be for this to be happening. Um, and in the TEC, one of the ways we've been doing that is through praise. That is a, a positive monitoring cycle. So the more people uh, talk about what others are doing in a positive way and have this incentive to see and be seen. This also enforces this idea of monitoring, but from a, from a light place, something that doesn't feel like that it's heavy to see what other people are doing and to be seen and also starts to create trust in a sense that you're not, that not only your bad actions are being seen, but the whole of you. And if there is something bad that is happening, uh, there is space to, um, to talk about them through the graduated sanctions and conflict resolution mechanisms. So graduated sanctions are also a way to have multiple ways of approaching something that doesn't follow the boundaries or the rules or the collective choice agreements, arrangements, that is um, having, a, having things being sized in the way they should be sized. So if there is a small problem, we don't need a big solution for that small problem. And that's more or less what the graduated sanctions bring. And she, she talks about it in a very beautiful way because she says it's a forgiving mechanism. So if you did something that you're not, um, I don't know, everything happens. People uh, have all different uh, uh, lifestyles and things that can, um, that can come up that are not expected. So if something happened and you're part of that community and you're not happy about what happened, you have the chance to um, forgive yourself and ask others for forgiveness by just complying with uh, one of the graduated sanctions. And when there is that system exposed, people feel a little bit easier on breaking the rules. So there is not like a super harsh, uh, like humans break the rules. And uh, when the rules were made by all the participants of that system, it's already, there's already not like so much incentive for you to make a rule that yourself made or that you were in agreement of. Uh, but then when that happens, there is like a system there that is like, oh, okay, if I break the rule, I know like how to uh, act in this scenario. And this also gives uh, a sense of safety and trust among uh, all participants that if something uh, more serious happens, there's also uh, a system in place. And then the conflict resolution mechanisms are basically the entity that will iterate on those graduate sanctions. And that is important. They're coming from a place of, uh, yeah, building trust and connection rather than being a punish, punishing entity. And in, in the TEC, Juan Carlos uh, has been leading Gravity. That is a very beautiful effort to bring the community together. So Gravity in the sense of like, we always have a force uh, pulling towards, uh, 
people being close to each other and that harmony is um, the main objective and not punishment. So how can we always keep harmony flowing? And does anyone have something to say until, until now? Comments? I just wanted to add actually two things um, about monitoring and information. I think this is also a huge point coming, I, I handle communications for a lot of communities and I noticed this is a huge challenge and for many communities, um, especially when it comes to engagement is just the mass amount of information that is flowing and how to manage that to make sure that people are informed, but that they're not bombarded and it's not just noise. So how do we work on that noise to signal ratio and making communications uh, for people who are busy and we're all often overloaded with information. Um, so I think we're still learning uh, in decentralized communities how to manage that information flow in the best way for people to be able to engage and feel empowered but also not feel overwhelmed or um, so. So yeah, I would love to hear some ideas about that. And then when it comes to graduated sanctions as well, I've been having a lot of thoughts and it's just exploratory right now of kind of restorative justice and how perhaps that there are ways we can kind of, for lack of a better analogy, Aikido, some of that kind of energy where people are coming and gaming the system. Is there a way um, like uh, Catch Me If You Can, the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio where he's writing the bad checks and then they employ his help to catch others. So could we somehow, you know, people who are trying to game get coin grants, could we go to them and say, hey, why are you doing this? Is there anything we could do to support you? Or, hey, would you like to help join our task force or like monitoring um, group that, you know, can look out for these kind of behaviors and how can we bring you into the community instead of exclude you from the community? Um, so yeah, just a couple of thoughts on that. And does anyone else have any thoughts about those first six or seven? I know, uh, yeah, it's it's quite a lot and <laughs> we've got time I, now. I have a question, if that's all right, ready to anyone. Um, yeah, I'm just curious about um, sort of monitoring and conflict resolution um, in a space of sort of inclusivity, um, when people have such different ways of processing information and understanding things. Um, I guess I'd be curious to hear about your experience in how do you manage that people might have a different understanding of what a rule is, or they might appear to be behaving in a way that seems like they're not um, acting in accordance with the rules, but actually perhaps it's just they literally have a different way of processing information or a different way of kind of expressing themselves. I, <clears throat> I would like to say something. Um, yeah, well, um, hi, my name is Juan Carlos Bell and yeah, I am the steward of gravity and um, I am from Colombia. I have a Magister de degree in conflict management. And um, like the idea um, and the focus that we want to give to conflict management um, from the approach of gravity, yeah, is to foster non-adversarial positions and to foster dialogue. I think that dialogue is a really important and strong uh, tool that sometimes we undervalue. And that's what causes like uh, uh, problems of communication and misunderstandings and lack of trust. So um, what I think is that when we are able to talk about all topics and we feel safe and uh, we feel that there are spaces and a culture that embraces um, um, talking about um, what can we improve and that is um, able and has have yeah spaces for people to express um, different opinions, then uh, people um, doesn't feel constrained to do it. And uh, if you um, like give easy access for people to request um, any support, um, you can also have the the community participating in 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 that um, conflict management and acting like a swarm. 
um, so that um, we can like uh, tackle the issues um, in the when they are small and don't let them es escalate uh, without um, without uh, yeah proper management. And um, I, I really like um, this uh, phrase um, from one of the uh, community members, uh, Durgas, who says, um, "We we we become what we educate." So I feel that just by normalizing talking about conflict management, we become more um, prone to be able to manage conflict than if there is no 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 uh, talking or no discussion about it. So it's just like normalizing that social structures, organizations, and uh, public goods and commons have have um, conflicts, social conflicts that. Can, can can be even produced by 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 the inner um, psychology of or or the inner context of, of of one individual and can affect others and the and the com community as a whole. So it's important to take care of each individual as a as a valuable uh, part and and taking care of yeah of of, of the well being of one for taking care of the well being of everyone. And when people feel safe. Yeah, um, you you start creating a safe environment um, of sharing. So yeah, it's it's that's like the idea that we are trying to 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 build around that. I love that. And then, so what came to mind when you were speaking then would also be alongside the human interaction would be like clear signposting and structures in place that people know almost as soon as they step into a space. If I'm having an issue or if I don't understand something, this is where I go. This is the process I follow. Is that what you found? Yes, um, we have like an input mechanism that is um, a type form where people can like say, oh, hey, I'm having this trouble. And then like people that we train on, on conflict management approach to gather more information about the, the issue. And uh, if there is, it's, if it's necessary, then uh, they talk to the other part. And uh, if it's necessary, we, we can uh, offer a mediation to try to, yeah, to, to reach an agreement. But um, uh, this is also, this is like when conflict happens, but there is a strong component that is prevention and prevention, um, um, yeah, it's a key part of conflict management because it's it's not like okay, let's screw things and then and then uh, say I'm sorry every time, but also like let's let's try to 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 make a safe environment for everyone. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hearing that and trying to tie it back to some other things that were brought up earlier, I mean that that speaks to the importance of at least in my mind, what I refer to it as humanizing a lot of these things of creating, you know, structured pathways for humanization, which I feel like is not a thing you frequently come across. But, you know, how do you get mindset alignment and culture alignment to want to view conflict, conflict resolution, not as you versus me, but us doing something and solving problems together. And it's a very interesting challenge, especially when it's in, in purely decentralized or distributed environments where anyone can plug in and out. You know, how do you get people to converge on mindset and culture? And to, to the point Jessica was making earlier with, you know, when there's just so much information, especially when you're just joining, how do you get onboarded for culture and what's happening and what role you can write? Like there, there's inherently a lot immediately happening. And so how do you create the most convenient you know, uh, what does the onboarding book of the future look like? And I doubt it's just a thousand page, you know, Google Doc or something like that. It's going to be multimedia. There's going to be time to, you know, access to things like, I, I don't know what the right way is because some people do like, you know, just like throw it all at me, let me swim through it and I'll, I'll find something and I'll dedicate the time. And yet I know there are a couple of communities that I really, really wanted to join, but the amount of time necessary to invest to catch up, I was like, I, I just don't have that time right now. Like I, that, that seems unfortunate that I want to participate. You want me to participate, but you need me to invest like 10, 15, 20 hours initially just to catch up. And 
yeah, I, I don't know what the immediate short-term steps are of the right way of, you know, playing around with some audio visual mechanisms for, you know, like, what are some good memes to align on the culture and mindset side? What are some, you know, like podcast episodes or YouTube videos that can ramp up of like, well, here's a quick view at like the 30,000 foot and the 15,000, but like keep bringing it down. So you make it like shorter at the higher level and longer as you go deeper. Um, but yeah, I feel like they, they, there's so much creating this content itself is a very time consuming thing. But the only other thing I just wanted to, to say also was on the game theoretic aspect and with uh, what Julio had mentioned in the conversation that come up around that. I mean, it's so interesting to think how some very small tweaks from a communication, right? Not even from the full incentive mechanism design, but just adding a little tweak with the kind of information, you know, the transparency that can be shared that can start adding elements of that humanization, right? I feel like pure game theory or crypto economic theory a lot of the time um, and economics in general, but I guess behavioral economics is trying to slightly adjust for that, but still they, they, they don't do a great job of injecting that humanization. And whoever made the comment of, you know, having more skilled facilitators and everything, I personally see folks like that actually having an interesting mix of community design and social work and mental health and something in the future. Uh, so they can really play that kind of cohesive role in, in ways that I personally haven't seen in a lot of communities, but I'll end my ramble there. Yeah, something we, we, we like to say in the TEC is that if you bump on something, it's going to be a person. And I think that's a, a, a way to have culture flowing in a way that it doesn't need to be like all of the information at once. And there was something somebody spoke yesterday too about like how, how do we make sure all voices are heard and that maybe shy people have a space also and that the culture are, is built in this more ground way. And there's something we've been doing that I think is quite effective. And we've been questioning, questioned about, about it at all because it's a little bit time consuming, but having uh, in the beginning of each call, a question or a moment for every person in the room to speak. And these questions, they vary from like, what is your favorite Austrian principle to what is your favorite ice cream flavor? Or like sometimes it's something very silly, but um, it's been very effective on people feeling like a part of something. And all of, and, and then that makes uh, people feel more comfortable to share more of what they think or more like a vulnerable uh, points of information that maybe if they didn't have that little time to speak, it would be a little bit harder. And, and definitely the meme and all of the production of this material that is easy to, for, for everyone to access is, is so challenging because everything is so complex and it's incredibly hard to transform complex information and very simple information and that's what everyone wants and that's that that's the the fun and also the challenging part of it so just recognizing we have about five minutes left and we still have two principles i am happy to stay a little longer if anyone needs to go at the top of the hour feel free but i feel like it was a lovely discussion, so I'm down to keep going, and I guess we can just keep keep this space till it um, goes. But uh, do we want to move into the last two principles, and then if anyone would like to stay a little longer, um, I am open. Olivia, I'm not sure if you can. Yeah, sorry, I'm having so many <laughs> problems with this. Uh, yeah, I can stay a little longer. And yeah, so maybe we can just give a little briefing on the on the two last principles that minimal, minimal recognition of rights to organize uh, relates to uh, mostly legal. So how, how large is the institution where is it inserted in and do all of this collective choice arrangements have rights to exist will they be stopped by someone so maybe we have like 
all of these rules and agreements that we made, but then will the police come here and tell me I cannot operate this way? So principle seven, it, 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 it just talks about that, of having just a minimal recognition of of the institution by anything that could compromise its existence. And then nested enterprises is, uh, just you can speak about this because I know you. Oh, that's okay. Um, so yeah, uh, nested enterprises, again, is one of those that has some interesting layers to it. Uh, and yesterday we talked about polycentricity and how when we're approaching um, different decisions within the community, how we we want want to start from a place of kind of curiosity or looking at the decision that needs to be made and the best way to make it before we jump to a tool. Um, and with this one, there are many ways that this can express, but you know, you, you can think of it as like multiple stakeholders um, and how different uh, layers kind of work uh, or are together within the system. So Elizabeth Sarturis, who you may know is a living systems evolutionary biologist. She talks about how there's room for competition and collaboration. And then there's a threshold where it is more beneficial to collaborate rather than compete, but that these are both necessary things um, within living systems. So I kind of started thinking about nested enterprises like this. And yesterday we talked about how hierarchy is not a dirty word and there are places for different layers and different levels of forms of decision making and different parts of that kind of power spectrum. So nested enterprise um, in a web three commons could be working groups um, or perhaps there could be DAOs, smaller squad DAOs that kind of iterate quickly and get things done with specialists within a larger DAO. Or when we're looking at DAO to DAO collaborations, uh, perhaps we can have some kind of meta DAO layers um, that are almost like confederated. And this is something too that is uh, going on in the research division. Common stack is, is looking at how DAOs can interoperate with each other. Um, so maybe we would in the future see some kind of nested um, DAO collaborations within larger, um, larger federated scales. So that I think that's something interesting in the future to explore. Um, so yeah, with our one minute. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Libby, if you wanted to. Yeah, I just, I just want to wrap it up. Uh, the, the thought of why presenting the three influential models first and then following to the eight principles. Uh, so the eight principles are the first time that an alternative to the three influential models were offered that it gives the possibility of self-governing institutions to, to work in a way that doesn't follow those models. So this is why Ostrom's work is so huge. And that's why she won the Nobel Prize in economics for because yeah, it was the first time those models were being proved wrong, let's say, or not wrong, but were, uh, that was a, the first time an alternative was, was given to them. And that's a lot of what we have to work with now but she, she makes it very clear in the book that this is even uh, just the first iteration and exploration of uh, the solutions and of opening this environment of self-governing institutions. So all of the work that we all have been doing with governance is really important to feed uh, these principles to uh, incorporate more information to the research especially from the empirical observations we're having and all the communities we work for. So it's really, yeah, if anyone has insights of governance, of how uh, all of these principles have been working, maybe even indirectly in communities you're part of, we're really interested in, in this conversation. So yeah, I was just going to say a, a mini wrap for those who have to go right now, and then we can stay for a bit. And there's a few more things we wanted to have some open chat about and hear ideas. Uh, it, I'm 
shared the Discord link um, for the Governance Research Channel. So anyone who has to go, I invite you there to continue the chat and we'll be sharing some links. And then if you have anything you want to share, and then just a quick note that in July or August, um, there is a group in the works with Token Engineering Academy as host is looking to have a host a governance research group that lasts for eight to 12 weeks for people who are working on projects and want to brainstorm ideas on how to develop um, or maybe who knows we're just gonna have this space where things can emerge and maybe it's educational apps maybe it's documentation but it's going to be a focused working uh, research group so we'll be announcing that um, whenever the plans come into formation but for now I just want to have the space where people can meet and have these discussions um, so pretty exciting coming up but yeah, uh, for people that can stay, uh, does anyone have any uh, anything to share on these last two principles, number seven and eight about nested institutions? And I know Mark has a lot to say about the legal aspects being a- No, not, the, not so <laughs> much the legal. Well, I mean, I did have a point to jump in on of, I really was dwelling on that comment on the prisoner's dilemma. And I thought it was more and I think, and then also the point on non-adversarial, it is sort of adversarial tokens, right? It would be like having police token and mafia token, and each of them had their own staking model. And you'll have to choose because it's not exactly a perfect example of, of nested enterprises. But if you're trying to then take that lesson uh, and not make it these two adversarial coins and which one are you gonna give, which stake are you gonna give up effectively? It's a, it's a policy trade-off um, was, was in really then Again, this this what you were talking about the hierarchical way, and then I then I wanted to share like on holacracy, thinking around yeah how you're having sort of the the role you're trying to flatten the hierarchy as much as possible while still trying to optimize your outcomes. So in the nested enterprises, still, and I think this is where it gets into quadratic voting. And I'm, I'm actually currently in Valencia today is the day they do the water court, which is featured in Ostrom's book. So I was thinking around also the uh, the principles of of, um, of how the the Valencian model is a bit like dandelion voting and I think the Alicante is a bit closer to like a quadratic governance model not fully fleshed out but nonetheless and how that is also in trying to minimize the hierarchy right it's a compression of the hierarchy effectively and so I just wanted to like leave with those thoughts on, com on compression of hierarchy so you're, you're having minimal hierarchy as, as possible when you're nesting it, making sure that you're actually still looking for the same goal, because um, obviously there's two, you, have, you might have two contradictory views, police and mafia, uh, and you need to reconcile that. And that also decides like a, a choice that that's where you can have sort of a, a decision made. Um, and then on how we're really working with the commons, what analogy are we making to our common pooled resources and does it look closer to the, I think from Ostrom's book, which which of those case studies does it look closer to, I think also helps guide the conversation in the the, the way we're gonna approach it because there's different sort of like different sub models in there. So those are my points, thanks. And I'm looking forward to the governance research group, <laughs> over. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to share too, and Livia, finally those slides that came up like three times. We're talking about the mafia or the police and i think um i'm realizing more and more i have studied with Sadhguru, and he talks a lot about um responsibility and i think also i a couple of years ago was hanging out with a lot of anarchists i even threw an uh, a kind of you know uh, anarchy themed conference and I started to realize too, there's this whole um, idea that's, I don't think anarchy is really what the main connotation is, it's kind of what I realized, I mean, growing up and hearing about it and then, you know, being with people and then being with Sadhguru is talking about responsibility. And I kind of just had this moment and was, and have been chatting with Livia a lot about how, you know, we kind of get in child mode, like when we're, um, for example, in Sadhguru, I, I stayed in the ashram and you participate in a program and you go through as a participant and you, you just, you don't think about food, you know, you're fed, you, you kind of get a little rebellious, like a teenager, like, oh, I don't want to, you know, deal with these rules. 
And then you come back as a volunteer and you give yourself in service and then you take responsibility. You take responsibility for everything around you that this program is happening the way it is. And it's just this like this switch. And I noticed in myself in that experience, it was really powerful for me just to to feel that like it, when you're kind of in child mode and you expect you have expectations of your environment, you have expectations of people to care for you. And then you go in adult mode and kind of like he talks a lot about being a mother to the world and looking around at everybody and, and you are the mother and you take responsibility for people in that way. And with that, like unconditional love, but also a sense of responsibility. It's like the people in DAOs who are doing, who are taking responsibility and stepping up to, to, to do work or lead or, or clean up after the party is kind of like how uh, Angela and I always talk about it. Like the people cleaning up after the party, it's not always fun or glorious, but it's like, we don't need police. We don't need a mafia. If we are policing our, you know, policing is not really a great word, but if we're monitoring ourselves and taking responsibility for ourselves, the people around us, and then I guess asking for help when we are in child mode, because that's okay too. Sometimes we're not in the space where we have the energy to really take care of everyone else around us. So I guess it's just some interesting thoughts, uh, some thoughts I've been having the last days about how responsibility plays into all of this, the prisoner's dilemma. And I feel like the whole question of how to get, I think there's a podcast called How to Citizen on the iHeart Network. Uh, and that, that whole question of how, how to, how to ignite that inner good citizen within people, uh, you know, starting with the people who want to be more active and then, you know, with wider, uh, with wider change, I think it's such a complex and loaded topic, but yeah, it's why it's super exciting to see these experiments and, and seeing how people can actually start to tweak certain incentives and communication channels and culture frameworks and all these, and the confluence of all these things to hopefully facilitate that. So I'm also super excited to see, what this summer eight to 12 week uh, kind of shared research idea. Uh, yeah, what, what, what will come of that? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. I also think like uh, it, it, it touches very much on, on what you're trying to do with the praise structure and, and looking at the, the taxonomies in similar way that the um, in discos for those that are, the, the, they're trying to break, they're trying to have different accounting models for their love work, uh, care work and agency. And so it is, it is, it can one possible solution be different accounting mechanisms for, for different types of, of things you want to incentivize in a broader ecosystem. So if you want to, you know, if you want to have the care work that is the cleaning up after the party or even setting up before the party um, or even separating those two, you know, if you need to, if you need to incentivize them separately, um, it's, that's a bit in the design thinking and the, what design space you have to make sure that you will optimize those incentives. So I, I really like that because I think there's a lot to, in that discussion with praise. And I think a lot of interesting uh, possibilities in trying to optimize those ecosystems in a very dynamic way. I'd like to quickly mention about the eighth principle about the nesting um, feature. And <clears throat> because this, um, this is very alive here that when humans get together as a large group, it's very different when they get together as a small group, right? In a sense. So it's so great to be able to uh, have a tighter boundary kind of say, okay, we are these eight people here. We are going to, we can have so much more quality communication and hear everyone's voice and, you know, co create much more easy than. Uh, with 50 people or 100 people. So it's very healthy for the organism to have organs in a sense, right? That can communicate between one another and of course, but uh, kind of have a hierarchy of purpose, not a hierarchy of people, you know? So we have a, a wider circle with a, a wider uh, purpose that's serving a, a lot of people. And then you have smaller circles with uh, uh, smaller purposes and they communicate and it's so great. I mean, this is so critical for managing large commons, you know? So 
I just wanted to mention that. And that, uh, at Haifa, we are talking about having this multi-tenant DHOs because the DHO is, the, is what we call the, the DAO for the humans, uh, distributed human organization. And then we have a nested kind of set of, of DHOs that can manage large uh, commons. So yeah, that's what I wanted to mention. And I think there's a lot of uh, interesting research into um, DAO to DAO collaborations. You know, we have a lot of the research so far has been in how do people coordinate in a DAO, um, but uh, it's interesting to see, you know, how DAOs coordinate as well and what kind of tools are needed for resource sharing, reputation sharing, fund sharing. Um, it's kind of like a, a one fractal layer above uh, the human to human coordination within a DAO is how do you have, you know, human to human coordination between DAOs as well. Uh, you know, how do organs communicate to each other? They have different flows, they have different purposes, but they still need to coordinate in the larger organism. I think that's a really, really important point. And by the way, we do have a suggestion for that on the seeds ecosystem, because we see the, the DHOs communicating between each other using the seeds currency and also uh, seeds badges. And, and the gratitude tokens, that's almost like the praise uh, system there. So you can share these uh, other tokens between the many DHOs and have visibility and reputation share and, and resource share. So let's see where this lands. <laughs> cool. I think we can probably wrap it up. How are you guys feeling? <laughs> So yeah, I guess uh, Love it. that was awesome. I, I was going to say, James and Renzo, we haven't heard from you. I was just soaking it all up. That was really insightful. I love talking about Ostrom's principles. They're like just under appreciated and simultaneously appreciated so much. Yeah, it was, uh, it was absorbing. It was uh, um, actually creating uh, potential scenario where we could experiment more in workshop where we could maybe break down the principles and bring in examples from communities to try out principles that match actually the arc of a purpose, like Yula said, but be actually intersection of the, these different ideas. So we could map out these insights and then create uh, basically avenue of a concrete experimentation. That would be my insight. So I was actually taking notes on the mirror board so you could find something more. So uh, later on, we can develop. So thank you so much, Livia, and Jess, and everyone. Hello. Oh, thanks. thanks, everyone. And I'll just say, too, I mean, I think, too, we have a lot of these conversations, and then it kind of, like, peters off. I feel like a lot of events are just kind of, like, people talk at you for an hour and maybe talk a little bit. But we're trying, I guess, to see how we can carry this energy forward because there is so much interest and in across the space and how important it is to share um, these ideas and seed them in other communities. So um, we just threw up a, a Discord channel because we thought it would be nice to have this space. Um, so we just happen to be doing it in common stack, although we're part of many communities. And also Julio, I know we just joined the Haifa DHO, um, the Haifa Discord so that we can maybe have a bridge channel there and, and um, share these works and then if anybody I know many here are very busy but what we're thinking also is that we can have the space so that we can start to collaborate on work together to document to write together um, to map together and to create visuals and Eugene your idea sounds pretty interesting so anyone who wants to lead the charge on those efforts. There are a lot of people here that could at least give a little bit of time, can edit, um, have different skills. So it'd be neat to be able to channelize um, some of this energy into some something we can share um, besides a one hour video for people to watch um, and with other communities. So look forward to, to having more discussion. And if any of you want to host an event, um, we're, we're up for you know sharing that around or having it wherever and continue to, to have the conversations. But as you said, Julio, maybe having some small groups is nice as well. So yeah. Amazing. Uh, the
Oh, that was <laughs> just realized that sounds like mate, but I was talking yes to the mate, Eugene. I love that so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. These were a great wor uh, workshop yesterday and today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Love the Looking forward to more conversations. See you. See you guys soon. Bye.